Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. On November 30th, 2015, high-ranking officials from most countries on Earth will convene for two weeks at the so-called COP21 summit in Paris. The objective of this international conference is to reach a strong agreement, which many parties hope will be legally binding to curb greenhouse gas emissions and keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius. To learn more about South Korea's efforts and interests with regards to the COP21 negotiations, we had the pleasure of interviewing Chong Soyeon, who is a professor at Korea University and one of the leading experts on the political and economic aspects of climate change in South Korea. Professor Chong was a member of the Presidential Committee for Green Growth, the honorary committee to host the Green Climate Fund in the Republic of Korea, and the Council of the Global Green Growth Institute. He sat on the Policy Advisory Board of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and is currently the director of the Seoul Center for Climate Sustainable Development, Law and Policy. He also chairs the Committee on International Cooperation at the Seoul Climate Change Center. Professor Chong holds degrees in law and international relations from Seoul National University and the London School of Economics. He received his PhD from the Stanford School of Law. Professor Chong Soyoung, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much. So why did you decide to focus your career on sustainability, green growth and climate change? I need to go back to year around 1994 when I was a graduate student at the Seoul National University. At the time, I was a typical law student who was dreaming of practicing or working on international affairs as a lawyer. So naturally, I had interest in the issues related to international court of justice. At the time, my professors at Seoul National University Law Department used to tell us that there is a very famous international law moot court competition which is held every year in the United States. And Korea must send some delegations. It has been more than 30 years and Korea has never sent anyone, so uh, we should do it. And at the time I thought about it and I was uh, thinking about uh, being a professor and uh, studying abroad, so I thought uh, why not uh, trying that. I got a you know questionnaires and it was about environmental matters. So at that time, around 1994 in Korea, nobody was working on the environment at that time, including climate change. So I was exposed to look at some of the uh, interesting issues, new issues at the time about the environment, and then naturally it opened up to my eyes on the issues, including climate change issues. And then I went to Stanford, and then there there is a wide range of of teaching and research activities going on on climate change. And then my supervisor, of course, was working very hard on climate change issues, and he's still doing so. So that also opened my other eyes on the, this area, and I thought that it's going to be blue ocean, which has been correct. Let us start the interview with the upcoming major international conference on climate change, the so-called Co-op 21, which will begin in Paris at the end of November. Many observers consider this event to be the most important conference in the matter of the past two decades. Three questions to start off. What is at stake at the COP21? Why is an agreement so crucial? And what are the chances of actually reaching a meaningful, actionable result? Paris Climate Change Meeting will be the most important international meeting, not necessarily on climate change in general. As uh, you may may not know that uh, before in 2009 we had the Copenhagen climate change meeting and very few people actually know that it was the largest ever summit meeting which was held outside New York since the United Nations was established. So we need to go back to that time that already climate change issues was uh, one of the most important global agenda. And uh, somehow we made a successful failure, meaning that uh, countries uh, failed in agreeing on the legally binding agreement. But at the same time, it was a success because it provided a good platform to continue to discuss about uh, some of the tangible outcomes which will be likely to be agreed in Paris this year. So naturally, there is uh, unfinished business among the countries on the very important issue of climate change. So I'm sure that not only uh, government representatives, but also all other stakeholders will come to Paris to finish the uh, ongoing discussions on how to create a new climate regime which will be valid from 2020. We call it as new climate regime. 
So uh, in this sense, there are several issues that needs to be discussed in Paris Conference. And then one of the features of the Paris Conference is that, different from other climate change regimes before, including UNFCCC and Kyoto Protocol, which we call the top-down based, meaning asking countries to take legally binding obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the countries worked really hard to implement that scheme, but the uh, fact is that in terms of outcomes of implementing Kyoto Protocol, number one, it was not as successful as countries wish it. Simply because if you want to rely on regulation-based approach to deal with environment issues, you need to have a very strong enforcement mechanism. And as you may know that in global society, we don't have a centralized system, meaning that we don't have enough efficient enforcement mechanism available to punish those countries who may not implement the obligations that, that they have to. So that's was number one. Number two, there is another issue that, awkwardly enough, current Kyoto Protocol only asks so-called developed countries to take the legally binding obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But as we all know that already that China, which is not classified as a developed country under the Kyoto Protocol, has become number one emitter in the world. There is no make sense in a sense that uh, we want to implement a climate change regime without including major emitters. According to a statistics, that if we want to keep the global temperature increase by 2 degrees, which is the recommendation made by IPCC, by 2030, we have to reduce 19 gigatons of CO2, meaning that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions a lot. And surprisingly, 4 out of 19 gigatons needs to be reduced by developed countries. Whereas, 15 gigatons out of 19 needs to be reduced by developing countries. What I just said is that developing countries don't have any legally binding obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In a situation where actually we have to ask them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions a lot, but that there is no legal mechanism to ask them to do so. So there is another important agenda that you know we need to get developing countries on board. So there are several issues that we need to discuss about. And I think that uh, countries are continuously working hard to make an agreement which will be applicable to all, meaning both developed and developing countries to work together to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that this is likely to be agreed in Paris. And then, then I think uh, countries will be ready to do so. So this is one of the things, then the how we can do it. As I said, that the top-down based, meaning once again, asking countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions based on legally binding obligations. You know, this scheme hasn't working really well enough as we expected. So what we need to do is that asking countries to take voluntary actions. You know, they understand that climate change is really important issues to tackle. And then they, we are asking them, bring your own plans on how to do it. And then we will aggregate all your plans and we hope that this would be better than just simply asking countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which turned out not that much effective. So we call it as bottom-up based approach, meaning that we are asking countries to take voluntary actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And third, then the, what countries can do in the context based on bottom approach, then, then another lesson that we have learned out of the several decades of the negotiation is that what countries are concerned about, including developed and developing countries, is that they care about development. They care about growth. They don't want to see a situation where climate change issues has become suddenly an issue of a burden so that, that they will lose the opportunity to grow then no country, including developed countries, will take that path. So what we need to come up is that we have to create a situation where climate change is an issue of opportunity, it's an issue of growth. So you do better take this on your own voluntary basis and bring your plan on how to use this as a making a new opportunity for you, then we will aggregate everything and we do hope that this will eventually decrease the uh, you know, emission of the CO2s and other greenhouse gas emissions. Then question will be, 
that countries need to agree in Paris is n how? That's the question. And then do we have an answer? I think we are likely to have an answer. That's about promotion of the low common economy. In Korea, under the Lee Myung-bak administration, Korea called it as low carbon green growth policy. And now under the Park Geun-hye administration, we call it as creative economy. If we go to China, actually China has been doing a lot in this context. They usually call it as low carbon development policy. Different countries seem to have names differently, but actually essence of all their actions are very similar. That's promoting low carbon economy. Then question will be, what is it about? It's about promoting low carbon green technologies, meaning promoting energy efficiency technologies like hybrid, LED technologies, and others, right? And the low energy efficiency technologies, renewable technologies, possibly nuclear, even if it's going to be controversial, CCS, and others, hydro you know, economy, and others. Promoting these technologies, and then make them available in the market, then we can create about 2% to 3% GDP scale of the world, which is going to be a huge market. Then countries can seize that opportunity to ensure the growth of their national economy. At the same time, it will ensure growth of the entire world. And then eventually, it will ensure that you know, we can actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So countries are ready actually to subscribe this notion during the negotiation in Paris. I do hope that, and I'm pretty certain even, that the countries can agree on it. Then next issue will be what kind of formality then countries will take. That's going to be the next question. Then there have been several options in front of countries to take the formality issue. We need to go back to Durban Climate Change Conference, uh, which was uh, held some years ago in South Africa. At the time, countries agreed to finish this negotiation by 2015. That's why we need to finish the negotiation in Paris this year. And then countries agreed to come up with the solutions in terms of formality among three options. Number one, a protocol, meaning legally binding treaty. Countries can agree on a legally binding treaty. Another form is a legal instrument. It could be a domestic legislation. It could be something else, not necessarily protocol, but may have some legal you know, effect. Third one is that unagreed outcome with legal force. You, know, you may not exactly understand what it means, but if you follow the uh, negotiation, it means non-legally binding decision of the conference of parties. So non-legally binding legal instrument. So you have uh, three options. Countries have been working on it. And then, of course, in terms of transparency, in terms of efficiency, it is always better for us to have a legally binding instrument. President Hollande came to Korea to actually get commitments from uh, President Park Geun-hye. How did the meeting go? Of course, the meeting between two summits went well. I feel a little bit sorry in a sense that the news media didn't cover the, the very important issue of uh, climate change as much as they should have. Maybe the Korean media was not aware of the uh, deep importance of climate change issues, or they might want to emphasize something else. But anyway, climate change issue was the uh, top agenda in front of the two summits uh, when they had a meeting. And then, of course, Korea agreed to support French government actions, and then also they agreed to work together in Paris conference for the successful outcome of Paris conference of UNFCC's meeting. So in the sense that it went well, very well, and then President Hollande, I think, uh, from his uh, short visit to Seoul, must have learned that actually Korea has done already a lot on promoting low carbon economy or addressing climate change issues. And then the, he should have better understand how difficult it was for Korea to come up with a 37% reduction plan you know, relative to BAU level as a part of the, its INDCs that was submitted to UNFCC secretary because of the, some unique situation, energy intensive industrial structure. And this is a country which is a very small size of the land, but there is a number of population living in this small land. And then Korea has very 
unique and difficult situation to tackle. And I'm sure that President Orlando found it. And then I'm sure that he must have appreciated what Korea has been doing in terms of how to tackle climate change by the single country. Korea ranks quite low on climate and energy, 93rd on the Environment Performance Index. Are you saying that Korea is actually committed to change quite drastically? As I said, before talking about the rank, you need to understand the, what is the general situation of Korea. In terms of population, Korea has a similar number of population with that of France. In terms of land size, if we compare the Korean land size with France, there is a huge gap. France has a larger area compared with that of Korea. And Korea has become a more role model for developing countries because all developing countries want to develop their economy in short period of time. And Korea demonstrated that example. And then when Korea started to develop its economy in the 1960s and 70s, what Korea relied on in terms of how to promote the economy was to invest heavily on the chemical industries, steel, automobiles, and others, meaning that all production based. It was a you know, very well organized and well recommended path of growth, which was provided not only by Korea itself, also by other eminent scholars and the leading countries and international organizations, including even with the World Bank. So Korea has become a very successful case. But what Korea didn't know at the time was the concept of low carbon economy because UNFCCC was created in 1992. Korea started to develop its economy in 1970. So now, for instance, Korea maintained you know, first class industry and steel makers and also shipbuilding. And then POSCO, for instance, which is the largest steel maker in Korea, represent about 10% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And then you need to decide whether or not you want to abolish that industry to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or you want to still work hard, better understand and better address the issues related to climate change given the factor. And here, tricky question. It's question to the entire world. Would you want to have a situation where there is no steel maker globally and still you want to develop your economy? Is it possible? My answer? And I'm sure the answer will be the same with others. No, not possible. So Korea takes a sort of pain of the entire world you know, to provide very critical material. But at the same time, if you meet uh, you know, CEO and then other business leaders of POSCO, what they will tell you, they already deployed best available low carbon technologies in producing steels. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be CO2 free because of the nature of the industry, but they are doing their best. So what you need to do at the country level, and if we want to still grow your economy, and you are not in a position where you just abolish the major industry for your economic activities, then you need to come up with a new solution on how Korea actually can further make efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, at the same time you know, making still very good contributions by providing very necessary raw materials to the entire world. And if you know this, then, then you might a little bit more appreciate about uh, what Korea has been doing. Another example is that Korea doesn't produce oil. Korea barely produces coal. Everything needs to be imported. In this situation, Korea has been doing a lot to cut the energy consumptions as much as it could. And then given the uh, natural factor, meaning that once again, large population in very small size of the land, and the Korea is an economic size of you know, top 10, and then what can you do? And then in this situation, and if we understand you know, in industrial composition of the Korea, then, then if we understand the basic starting point, Korea cannot be placed as with small developing countries which don't have production-based industrial activities. Once again, the starting point is that if entire world economy would like right to maintain its sustainability, you have to have a production base somewhere. 
And in that sense, Korea can be seen actually as a pretty good performer because you know, even if it emits CO2s, but it emits CO2 much less than, than those countries which may have a similar production base in their society. So in the sense that Korea tries to make its efforts, and then even if you take a look at the recent INDC that Korea has submitted to UNFCCCC, Korea even further you know, committed itself to utilize international market mechanism. Meaning that Korea would like to reduce greenhouse gas emissions if there is something that Korea cannot do in their own land. That Korea will help other countries to further reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and Korea gains some credits. And then we know that that's going to be good also for other countries as well because climate change is a global agenda. No matter which country will do, doesn't matter. We need to work together. We need to have orchestrated actions. In that sense, Korea proposed to have very good plans actually to make further contributions. In the sense that I might be biased a little bit as a Korean national, but I'd like to emphasize that Korea is doing its own best. Focusing on the domestic level, Following Europe and North America, South Korea launched its own carbon emission trading scheme in January of this year, 2015. Could you briefly introduce the concept of carbon trading? Carbon trading is very simple. Say there are 100 units that you need to reduce in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions to meet the target, maintaining 2 degree Celsius increase in temperature. Then, then individual economy actors may be able to say, oh, I can reduce 10, I can reduce 5, I can reduce 6, and if we aggregate it all, it could be say 110, then we need to reduce 10 more. So we will ask individual actors to reduce 10 more, and then what we are concerned about, in total, we need to reduce 10. So some companies may be able to reduce 2, Others may not be able to reduce the, you know, the unit at all. So anyway, if we can have a situation where we can anyway reduce 10 units, they can actually give and take the additional units that are available. In that sense, there is no free. So you have uh, additional units that uh, you can uh, sell us, then we will pay. So there is a market to be created. And then this market is like a stock exchange. They can actually exchange units based on the prices available at the time. So this is a general concept of emission trading scheme. The initiative taken in Europe has been met with quite a lot of criticism recently. Is carbon trading in Korea actually successful? How has it been for the past year? And how have the major corporations reacted to it? Uh, my answer is, is too early for us to say whether or not it has been successful or not. The one year is not enough. And then, as we all know, the general economic situation globally is not uh, fair enough for us uh, to make uh, any judgment. Anyway, in terms of size, Korea started to have a second largest ETS market in the world this year, which can uh, provide very significant signals to the entire world in terms of the importance of the utilizing market mechanisms such as the ETS. And so we know that uh, in terms of the volume of uh, trading, uh, it is still not as much as we wish it. And I'm sure that uh, once you start to run the, any institution, and in the beginning you need to fix some of the uh, issues that may not be appropriate to, to run. So Korea is in that stage. I know that some big companies still raise the concerns that ETS may not work as well as we wished in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, only giving the additional burdens to big companies. But once again, it's too early for us to think about. Actually, emission trading scheme is uh, you know, available in any basic textbook of environmental economics. So we are doing something which is available in the textbook, which tells students that this is one of the you know, very fundamentally available market mechanism if we want to deal with air pollution. So this is not something that is very extraordinary. So would you want not to implement something which is taught to the students in the textbook that this is basic? 
but the US society doesn't want to do it, then you will immediately create an image that your society is not ready to cooperate. So I would be a little bit positive in a sense that Korean ETS market will be eventually very good mechanism. And I know also that ETS is the only one that we can consider in terms of utilizing market mechanism. There are other means as well, such as taxes and others. And you know which ins market instrument can be utilized domestically Internationally, it could be a matter of policy option. It could be a matter of considering unique situation of a union society. So Korean society, Korean government needs to consider this issue as well. Whether or not Korea needs to combine other market mechanisms as well, or government needs to intervene to some level to better promote this ETS scheme. And then there are many issues that will be unfold in the near future. I'm sure that Korea will address them very well in the future. What would you say are Korea's main weaknesses in terms of climate change readiness and how is the government trying to target them? There are some issues that we need to think about. Number one, I think this happens in every country. If you are in the world of climate change, you know that this is a very serious problem. If you are in the climate change area, you know that putting your resources in promoting low carbon economy, you can change the entire scheme and which will be very beneficial to all the people. And then if you are in the climate change area, this is the issue that can help your country to be a global leader. So what's happening? What uh, we need to do in general, not necessarily in Korea, by all the countries is that there are other type of people and often they are majority, not minority. Meaning that, taking an example, what's happening in Korea. If we wanna promote low carbon economy, in terms of the which ministry will be responsible for this agenda, and usually it's not solely an issue of the ministry environment. You should work together with the ministry finance because they are in charge of planning macroeconomic policy. If we go to Ministry of Strategy and Planning of Republic of Korea, and then I know that those who are working on climate change understand the importance of promoting low carbon economy and reorganize Korean economy in that sense, but many other colleagues in the ministry have no idea about this. They only simply think that climate change issue is just a matter of environment. Why do we have to work on this even? So this happens in everywhere, and that problem exists in Korea. So that's the number one issue. And then we have to actually have to address that issue. Number two, weakness possibly in Korea, but that could also exist in many countries, is that because of the similar reasons that I mentioned. If we want to address climate change issues, we all know that there are two issues in climate change, mitigation and adaptation. But if we really want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you have to work on mitigation issues. And then if you closely work on the mitigation related issues, then you will end up with working on energy issues. And then usually climate change issues in the realm of Ministry of Environment, which is an important ministry. I'm not saying that they are not important. They are very important. In order to implement the detailed policy measures, then you also need to work together with Ministry of Energy because they are in charge of policies on energy issues. So here, problem exists because usually almost in every country, including Korea, they don't talk each other. Rather, they dislike each other. So uh, it suddenly become a matter of coordination. If your country has a very good coordination mechanism, usually backed by the very strong political will of your president or summit of the government, then, then you can address this problem. In Korea, at this time, I'm sure that the Korea current Bakunel administration working really hard on this matter. But I can be honest a little bit that compared with the previous government, the role of the president office has been weakened a little bit. This is not my own personal opinion, I would say. I'm sure that most of people who understand the climate issues in Korea 
raised these concerns uh, many times. But the one positive factor is that uh, current President of Republic of Korea has increased her interest in climate change issues much more than before, which is a very positive sign. And I'm sure that the current President would like to draw the attention on promoting low carbon technologies under the concept of creative economy, which will result in actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But I do hope that this government will have more focus on this agenda as well. Number three, if we take a look at the uh, organizations on climate change issues in Korea, surprisingly, Korea already hosts two major climate change organizations. First one is Global Green Growth Institute. Second one is Green Climate Fund. I had the privileges before to be involved with establishing or hosting these organizations. Then I still recall how exciting it was to work on these two organizations in terms of establishment, in terms of hosting the organization in Korea. And then we need to think about how much Korea has made its leadership role in promoting issues related to these two organizations. I often feel that even if we still see some linkages between these two organizations, but I often see that the Korean government or Korea as a whole may make more contributions to promote the important role of two organizations. Honestly speaking, uh, when I look at the, uh, these organizations, one of them, I, I might say that their focus has been shifted a little bit from the initial objectives to something else. And I do have some concerns because to take climate change and then, then they were supposed to do something as planned. And always if you are involved with the politics and then things are changed and sometimes you, you can come back and then you can you know, reorganize things. And we are in the middle of you know, having this dynamic. But still, I do hope that Korean government can exercise in a more coordinated way to promote feasibilities, also contributions of these two international organizations on climate change. So Korea needs to work on it a little bit more. I'm sure that I'm academic, so I'm always idealistic, so uh, you know, I don't want to unnecessarily hurt my colleagues in the government, but I do hope that you know, we, we will do a little bit more. And fourth weakness is that Korea is the 10th largest economy. I said that Korea maintains the you know, second largest ETS market. Still, Korea is a small country in terms of size of the business. So Korea needs to make everything international. And here, to make things international, you need to be able to exercise leadership, right? You need to set the global agenda on this issue, and then you need to lead the discussions with other colleagues and stakeholders or governments. And in the sense that I have a little bit question to what extent that Korea can set the agenda, Korea can take the leadership role in promoting all these important things. Korea is very good at working together with others, but Korea didn't have much experiences in terms of setting agenda or leading the agenda with other countries. But this is a time when Korea needs to work on it. And fifth, in general, Korean society is constrained by the issues of North Korea. And here, climate change issues, the same issues can be considered as well. Because Korea already emits a lot of CO2s, and if you take a look at the per capita emission of the North Korea, actually their emission level is very high compared with the, to the countries having similar level of economic development. Do you know why? Because they lack the uh, energy sources, they lack the food. So what they do, they cut the trees to get energy sources and food. So in Korean Peninsula, South Korea cannot avoid any situation without North Korea. And then we also need to take care of North Korea issues as well. And I know that, that the, some the positive actions have been made, such as the providing the seats to North Korea so that we can you know, reconfigure the forestry issues in North Korea. Uh, you know, South Korea started to cooperate with North Korea on this matter, but still 
Korea needs to come up with a better idea on how to work together with North Korea. Why is it weakness? Because Korea cannot develop entire range of issues to tackle climate change without including North Korea. And then recently submitted INDC report of Korea in terms of additional 11% to meet the target of 37%. Uh, relative to BAU level, 11% includes utilizing market mechanisms. And the market mechanism somehow needs to include uh, creating new market mechanism with North Korea. So without having North Korea on board, actually Korea may feel difficulties even in implementing the uh, INDC targets that uh, we voluntarily committed. So there are several weaknesses. Well, once again, I would like to emphasize that most of the weakness is not Korea specific. It exists in everywhere. So rather, Korea needs to take it as a matter of a chance to take further leadership role by creating very good best practice. And then showing that we can actually overcome all these weaknesses that exist in everywhere. I'm sure that Korea can do it. President Im Yong Bak was a very strong proponent of green growth, but in contrast, as you mentioned, President Park has replaced it by creative economy. The Financial Times reported last year that President Park has sought to distance herself from her predecessor, and the Presidential Committee on Green Growth, which she participated in, was actually downgraded to the prime ministerial level. Is that just a cosmetic change or real change in focus? As you said that uh, I was a member of the President Committee on Green Growth, and then the, somehow it was a very, very active committee and promoting the uh, low carbon green growth policy. I enjoyed the moment uh, when I uh, work on the you know climate change issues as a member of the President Committee on Green Growth. There has been some criticism that maybe the focus of the uh, Korean government on climate issues has been downgraded at least. And then I would rather answer this question in a different way. As I said, low carbon green growth and then creative economy have some commonalities. And rather, current administration needs to show, demonstrate to the general public that actually there is a very important aspect of creative economy and then that is related to previous green growth policy in general tackling climate change issues. If we follow up the uh, sort of you know schemes of identify new technologies which will become that are marketable in the near future many of them are related to green you know first of all if you don't listen to the, the specific word of green you might think that uh, there is nothing existing but I would suggest that's not the case it has been reorganized very much in different way but then two issues come in Number one, president herself needs to demonstrate that actually creative economy can demonstrate that it's a major source to tackle climate change uh, by Korea. And once again, as I keep saying today that emphasizing technology meaning that you want to create markets. So Korean government has that scheme already. But the question is the how to coordinate the, all these different actions by different ministries. So if you talk to some ministry, which used to be placed as a central part of the low carbon green growth, and now they are not centrally placed in the creative economy, then they might say something differently. So you also need to go to Ministry of Science, for instance, and then that they will tell you, what are you talking about? We are doing a lot of green issues. Actually, they do. And then, then in a way, we are ready to tackle climate change. So in the sense that, you know, generally speaking, it's a fair statement that Korea has decreased in terms of the interest on climate change issues in general, but possibly not as much as you may have thought about. So uh, if you look at uh, business activities, uh, large companies like LG, Samsung, even SK Group, they didn't have interest in climate change in year 2008. I did interviews with them and even they, do, they didn't want to have interviews. Now they have major climate change related companies running. So in that sense that there has been not much change. General perception 
may matter. And uh, if Korean government needs to tackle that, they should tackle that so that we can generate the uh, image to the people in Korea, also people outside Korea that Korea is continuously working on these issues. And then this is something that Korean government must do now. President Im Yong bak spearheaded the creation of the Global Green Growth Institute, based in Seoul, as well as the Green Climate Fund, which is just outside of Seoul. Have those two entities actually delivered tangible results yet? Uh, let's uh, talk about the Global Green Growth Institute first. So uh, I today talked about the uh, promoting low carbon economy. And then I mentioned that in order to promote the low carbon economy in your country, you should work together with not only Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Finance as well, because it is related to macroeconomic policy. And then if we place that in the general context of the developing countries, whether or not they have a relevant expertise, whether or not they have relevant resources actually to make their economic growth plans based on the concept of low carbon economy, user answer will be no. And then I said today that it's likely that the Paris Conference of Parties this year will agree on promoting low carbon economy as a major way of tackling climate change issues. Then I also said that even developing countries need to take part in actually working together in promoting low carbon economy. Who can help developing countries? or advanced developed country, they may not know entirely. I don't know that, uh, for instance, Greece, which is a part of European Union, is very well aware of the concept of low carbon economy. Maybe some leading European countries are aware of it, but not entire European Union countries. So we need to have a very much important organization which can provide expertise on how to design the low carbon economy path considering the specific situation of that country. This is something that the GGGI is supposed to carry out. And then my question is that whether or not GGGI meets that expectation uh, now and then I'm sure that there are several issues that we need to take care of. I know that GGGI is just a young organization. We cannot expect a child to run immediately. So we need to help you know, this organization better perform. And then who can do it? Is there any coordination mechanisms among the uh, governments or you know, donors who would like to support the GGGI to carry out this? What about the leadership issue inside the uh, GGGI secretariat? Whether or not they have uh, enough expertise? And GGGI is uh, pretty much linked to the you know, leading experts on this agenda globally and then what about their coordination mechanism with the United Nations or GCF and other major sources so there are many issues then 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 we need to work on it in terms of GCF uh, well in Copenhagen what country agreed is that uh, in year 2020 long-term finance scheme will be to have 100 billion US dollars every year when GCF was created, first of all, there was a possibility even for GCF to take part of all this amount. But at the time, we had already global environmental financial mechanism called GEF, Global Environmental Facility. I thought that there would be some healthy, I would say, institutional competition between the relevant organizations. In that sense, if I want to be very ambitious, GCF may lose its opportunity to become a major climate change financing mechanism, taking all this amount, almost all this amount of 100 billion US dollars. But now, what the GCF has been doing you know, based on the decision of their governing body, meaning that the GCF was successful to raise 10 billion US dollars, 10% of the originally planned, which is still very successful. But once again, if you want to be ambitious, then, then you might want to have more. So this involves the issue of politics. This involves the issue of governance. This involves the issue of what is the role of the key players, key playing countries, including Republic Korea and others. This is number one issue. Number two, however, GCF in November, you know, started to implement projects as planned. 
So it's too early for us to say that their implementation would be successful or not because this is just a starting point. But at least one positive aspect of the issues is that GCF started to run its projects. So that's the issue that we can think about. Number three, what about the uh, public-private partnership in GCF? They created a very unique department called Private Sector Facility. The head of this section, director of this section, used to work at a city bank in London, meaning that GCF is very much committed to promote the private sector investment through GCF, which will flow to help you know, developing countries in developing their low carbon economy. Then we need to still wait until that actually there will be actions made by private sector in terms of providing money to GCF so that we can actually see that GCF can be intermediary between public financing and private financing to promote the low carbon economy in developing countries. So there are several issues that we need to think about. And then question once again, can Korea lead all these discussions as a host country? If we take a look at GGGI, Korea is uh, only one single permanent member of the council. Council is the governing body of the GGGI. Korea is the only single permanent member. Korea is the largest donor to the GGGI. And the Korea is the host country of the GGGI. Maybe Korea can make more voices with the GGGI. Whereas, in regard to GCF, GCF is a part of the UN organization. And then Korea hosts that organization, but Korea is not a member of the governing body yet. So Korea cannot stay there all the time. So if I were someone who would be able to suggest their strategies on how to promote all these organizations in Korea, I would rather focus on the GGGI a little bit more and then promoting GCF actions to support actions of GGGI because GGGI has a huge potential to become the major organizations in the world to promote low carbon economy. And so uh, I would suggest that Korean government may consider this idea. Is the government actually pushing for that or has it just ticked the box we are hosting it and now moved on to other concerns, new boxes to tick? Uh, hard to answer. Government, I think uh, they are considering. GGGI is, is taken care of by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whereas GCF is taken care of the, by the Ministry of Planning and Strategy. So if you visit every country, these two ministries are the most important ministries, and uh, usually they work together, but they don't work together as closely as they are supposed to do. So that coordination matter issue exists in Korea at this time. So in the sense that once again, as I suggested, that the president office needs to show more strong signal to these two ministries in the context of promoting creative economy, saying that in order to promote economy nationally and internationally, two ministries needs to develop the uh, one single package of the policy through which they can promote actions of the GGGI and GCF. I think that this is the answer. In conclusion, recently scholars and practitioners of international relations have been increasingly talking about South Korea's climate change diplomacy and climate change leadership. Is that something that Korea is going to push for in the future? And did it carve itself because no major power could actually do that? Well, Korea has been seen as a very active country in tackling climate change issues. And as I said today, that uh, tackling climate change is a new issues to everybody. So this is just a, we are in the same starting point. And then luckily enough, Korea sees this as a chance of promoting its economy. Also, by doing so, because Korea needs to be international, Korea naturally became very internationally active. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, what we are doing is enough because all the time the situation is being changed in, in promoting climate change and different schemes and different stakeholders, different uh, you know, organizations coming in and then, then politics and others. In the sense that Korea needs to continue to exercise its leadership role. To become a leader, actually you need to set the agenda. 
right? Nobody will tell you that you should do this. So in the sense that Korea needs to go beyond the stage where Korea used to be seen as a very good follower, very quick and good follower. Now we are entering into a new realm where Korea must set the agenda and give the signals to other countries. Of course, Korea cannot do it by itself. Korea is a middle power. But Korea can generate very good movement with very good partners. It could be China, it could be France, it could be UK, it could be United States, and Korea can work together with all of them. I think this is an you know, advantage where Korea can exercise more leadership role, and I do hope that Korea will do it. Professor Jong, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.